just, I had been thinking about something, and this hymn sing today convinced me of it. The Sunday before Thanksgiving, which will be the 20th, okay? I'm not preaching. We're not preaching. Did you quit? No. Nope. <laughs> I planned to be here. But we're going to have a service where you have the opportunity to stand up and give a two sentence testimony. I mean, just whoever. Okay? I want you in two sentences or less, and I don't mind cutting you off if you get that <laughs> third sentence going, okay? Because you're not here to do preaching, you're here to do testimony. But I'd like you to come, and if God has done something for you that you want to give thanks for, that's the theme of the testimony. And interspersed, we're just going to do some hymns. And we're just going to give God thanks on that Sunday. Okay? And I'll probably close out with a verse or two. But uh, maybe three. I don't know. I'm not kidding. But the point is, that will be your service. To testify of what God has done for you. And to give thanks for it. And so you plan on it, okay? Now, you don't have to say anything. But if you'd like to, we want you to. And we'll intersperse some hymns. It's just going to be a service of thanksgiving. Amen, sir. You say, why are you doing that? Because I'm the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're doing it because we need to be a thankful people. Yes. Amen, sir. And sometimes you don't need to hear me talk. We need to hear you talk. Take your Bible and go to the book of Genesis, very first book in your Bible, and chapter 5. I'm preaching the second of three sobering sermons. This week, we're talking about planning your funeral. Genesis 5, verse 4. I want you to notice the end phrase. This is Adam. And he died. In verse 6, you have Seth. And in the end of verse 8, Seth died. Then you have Enosh. And in the end of verse 11, and he died. Verse 12, you have Kenan. In the end of verse 14, and he died. You have Mahalalel in verse 15. Verse 17, and he died. You have Jared in verse 18. Verse 20, and he died. Now here's something different. Enoch, hmm. verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He didn't die. Now Enoch is a picture to us of what many believers call the rapture. That is out of 1 Thessalonians 4, where the Bible tells us that God is going to send Jesus. Jesus is going to raise the dead that are believers. But if you are alive at that moment, you will be caught up with him without facing death. And so there will be that only exception to death. Otherwise, everybody in here is dying. Anybody want to get that phone? Notice verse 28, or 25. Methuselah, oldest man who ever lived. Verse 27, and he died. Lamech, verse 31, and he died. And he died. There is a certainty to death. It's true in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 8. The preacher who wrote Ecclesiastes said, there is no discharge from the war between life and death. In other words, nobody gets out of life. In the New Testament, Hebrews 9 verse 27, the Bible says, it is appointed for men to die once, and after that, the judgment. The certainty of death. The Arabs have an old proverb. It says, death rides a black camel, and he must kneel at every man's door. 
Probably there is almost nobody of any age in this room who's not had that black camel kneel at the door of somebody near to you. Yes. And you know the pain and the grief of it. Yes. Death is certain. I entitled the sermon, Planning Your Funeral. Someone asked me about it, I said, well, really, it's just a nice way of saying you're going to die. You're going to have a funeral of some sort. You say, well, Tim, isn't that morbid? No, that's motivating. To think about the fact that if Jesus doesn't catch us away, we will die. Now, why is it motivating? Well, first of all, there is a practical aspect to the idea that in preparing for death, you are being a blessing to others. Think about Ahithophel. He was a counselor to King David. The Bible says his counsel was so wise, it was like an angel of God. And the Bible says before he died, he set his house in order. That's in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. Our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we will honor momentarily with the communion, hanging on the cross before he dies, he makes arrangements for his mother. He says to John the Apostle, Son, behold your mother. He says to his mother, Mother, behold your son. And the Bible says John then took her home to take care of her. Even before he died, Christ took care of his mother. He made arrangements. I want to say to you this morning, very practically, you ought to have a will. So that when you have died, somebody knows what to do with those possessions that may either be of value economically or be of value sentimentally. But you want something good to happen for those whom they will affect. You need to organize that with a will. I do about 30 funerals a year, most for families who are not connected with churches. And it is sad how many times the funeral director tells me the person that died had no will and it's a mess. Perhaps it's wise for you to have a living will. Every time I go to the doctor, he says, do you have your living will? I think, what is he trying to tell me? <laughs> but the idea that medically, if you get into a condition where you cannot make your own choices, you need to have given somebody the guidance and the permission to make those beneficial choices for you, whether you want to survive or just let them let you go. That's a living will. You need to have some basic information put together about the things that you possess or the things that you are concerned about, the bills you owe or what responsibilities you might have, things that need to be tidied up. One of our sisters, uh, Barb, uh, let me see this. She has said, it's a book called I'm Dead. Now what? And it actually has several chapters where you can write in who needs to be contacted, what bills need to be paid, what things need to be cut off, utilities, etc. Just all those things that are thrust upon somebody when you die. It's so much more a blessing if it's already laid out and dead in here. You say, wait a minute, Tim. I thought this was church. Shouldn't you be preaching to us about reading the Bible and praying? Not talking about wills and living wills and books about I'm dead. Let me tell you something. Number one, most of the time when a pastor deals with problems in people's lives, it's not because they haven't been reading the Bible or praying. It's because about practical things that have not been handled. In the relationships or responsibilities. Number two, you want to get practical? There's a book in your Bible. It's called P-R-O-V-E-R-B-S. Proverbs. It is full of practical advice on how to live your daily life. So I believe sometimes as a pastor, you need to say to your people, hey, let's get practical. 
Because there have been times in my life when I was reading the Bible like crazy, crazy, and praying all the time, and my life was still screwed up. Because there were some other things that needed to get straightened out and taken care of. Planning your own funeral. Maybe, yes, literally planning your own funeral. Maybe there's a song that you want sung. I have a dear friend, Cliff. We joined the church together over at Hebron, United Presbyterian years ago. Cliff was a referee all of his adult life for college, football, and basketball. When we carried him out of the church, they played, take me out to the ball game. Now, I don't know that you, you might be thinking of a sacred song, okay? But, you know, many times, again, I call families who've had a loved one pass. I say, well, do you know if there's any uh, special song they might like? And most of them, well, I don't know. Well, if you have something that, like one of these hymns, might be a blessing to you, put it down. Let somebody know. Maybe it's a scripture. I even think maybe write down five things you want people to know about you. Or maybe five things they never knew about you you'd like to shop in. <laughs> but plan your own funeral. You see, that's morbid. No, it's motivating. Because what it does is not only helps others so they know what your wishes and desires are, because you're not around to ask. And you say, well, it's not going to matter to me anyway. You're absolutely right. But that's selfish, because it does matter to them. And so you are to honor. Number two, along that same line, it's actually beneficial to you. If you give some thought to death. Sir Isaac Newton, considered one of the smartest men that ever lived, said every person must spend five minutes a day thinking about dying. If they did, they'd be better prepared to live. The Apostle Paul said, I die daily. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 31. He said, I die every day. I face death every day. You see, as Paul was out there being stoned for Christ, he knew there were people that would want to stone him, people that want to beat him, people that want to kill him. And you know what? He just said, I know I'm going to die. I know it could be today. So I'm just going to go out there and give it all for God. Amen. So that whenever that death day comes, I'm not ashamed. They've done studies, and they've actually found when they separated two groups of people, people that didn't really focus on their upcoming death at all, and I mean, it could be whenever, years away, or tomorrow, but they just said, we want you to take a few minutes each day and maybe write down what you'd like your funeral be right, like, or write down what you might want to do before you die, or write down how you think your death will affect somebody else. And they said they found in these studies the people that actually spent a few minutes a day thinking about their death generally lived healthier and happier. They lived healthier because they took a little more consideration about the lifestyle they were living that might kill them. And number two, happier in the sense they really said, what do I want out of life? And so they really focused on that instead of just kind of going along. You know, sometimes we just you know, watch TV day after day after day or we do whatever day after day. And finally, one day we'll wake up, man! I'm wasting my life. I need to seize the opportunities while I have the opportunity. That's the idea. Actually, in part, this sermon was motivated by I was listening to the radio. Oh, Pastor Tim, you were listening to Christian radio. No, I've got a confession to make. I was listening to the sports station. <laughs> and, uh, Paul Alexander is a sports commentator, and he was talking about the gentleman who started, the gentleman who started as the senior starting quarterback at the first of the year, and he wasn't playing well, so they benched him. And the second guy came in, he got injured, so they brought the other guy off the bench, and he played great, who had been a starter, but he got benched. And he said, why do you think he played so great coming off the bench? He said, because when he was the initial starter, he was just trying to be careful to save his job. But after he lost the job, he didn't really care. He got up there and let him rip and played great. And the idea is, folks, as the song The Rose, it says, there are some people who are so afraid of dying, they never learn to live. I'm not telling you to play it stupid, but I am telling you, sometimes don't play it safe. Just get out there and live. Do some of the things you'd like to do. Take a risk. Take a step. This Paul Alexander, he said, Go ahead, you're going to die anyway. So eat that piece of cake. 
And I thought, man, in my case, it's don't eat that piece of cake. I've eaten enough cake. That's why I'm going to die. But you get the point. And I want to share one other thing with you that's been very meaningful to me. It's about people who were dying and giving consideration to not only their death, but to their life. It's called Five Regrets of the Dying. This woman surveyed people who were terminally ill, and these were their five main regrets about they looked over their life as they headed toward their death. Number one, I wish I had had the courage to live the life I wanted to live, except instead of the one others expected of me. Number two, I wish I had worked so hard, or in other words, so much time at work. Wish I'd taken time to smell the roses. I wish that I had had the courage to express my feelings. How many times we've kept our mouth shut when we really wanted to share? I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish. I have let myself be happy. See, thinking a little bit about death helps you not to have so many regrets about life. And then finally, there is a spiritual benefit. As I've shared with you in previous sermons, my mom would teach me some Bible verses when I came home from kindergarten. And before I could watch Sheriff John and the cartoons, I had to learn a Bible verse. And why she chose this one, I don't know. <laughs> but Amos 4 and verse 12, there's a phrase in it that says, prepare to meet your God. You see, Hebrews 9, 27, I quoted at the beginning, it says, it's appointed unto us once to die, but after this, there's a judgment. There is given an account after death for the life we've lived here. So, with that in mind, I asked my dad for one of his gospel tracts that he's written. My dad's a preacher, for those of you who are fairly new, maybe you've not met him yet, uh, Dr. Tom Williams at Vangelis. He's written a gospel tract. He hands it out. He says, when will you die? And it makes people think about there's no guarantee of tomorrow. And he encourages them in this way. He says, you do not receive Christ by communion, baptism, church membership, or any good work. You receive Jesus Christ by faith. Faith is simply believing God means what he says. Right now, if you will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead, the third day, you will be saved eternally. The Lord Jesus is the only answer to death. Amen. So since we're facing life after death, let it be eternal life by receiving Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And you know, when you really give focus to the fact that someday and maybe soon you'll die, it might even motivate you, even if you know you are saved, it might motivate you to live better as a Christian. I told the Sunday school class recently about a fellow in North Carolina. His dad was on his deathbed. He went to visit his dad, and his dad said, Son, I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I know I'm going to heaven. He said, I'm not afraid to die. But he said, I am ashamed to die. With the little I've lived in my life for Christ. Al Cole was a preacher for the regular Baptist churches uh, in the United States, and he was part of that group, and he was their Eastern representative, and the doctor told him, he said, Alan, you've got an incurable cancer, you've got three months to live. After about two months of that, Alan did come to the National Conference of the GRBC, General Association of Red Baptist Churches, and he gave a testimony. He got up, they helped him up on the platform, he gave a testimony. He said, let me tell you something. He said, in the last two months, in the three months that I've got left, he said, I've done more speaking out for Jesus Christ. In all the years I was a preacher before that, because he said, you know what? Anymore, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. It doesn't matter. I want to be dead anyway. He said, what matters is that I live for Christ. He said, I want to go to the barbershop. He said, hey, can you open in your magazines a minute? I want to tell you something. Now, you might not do that, but I think you get the idea. You just
just give it all up for Christ. Because you don't know him. But when it's when, you'd like to be not only not afraid, but not ashamed. I'm going to close with a little story that I've always remembered. And it's been helpful for me to face the fact that you don't escape to hell. There was a man in the city of Baghdad in ancient times, and he had a servant. And he sent his servant to the marketplace and said, I want you to go get some things. And the servant went to the marketplace, and while he was gathering the things, he met death face to face. He dropped the goods. He ran back to his master and said, Master, I've just met death face to face. What should I do? And the master said, take my fastest horse and ride from Baghdad to Damascus. And the servant jumped on the horse and headed off. The master went down to the marketplace, searched till he found death. And he said, death, why did you not frighten my servant? And death said, did I frighten you? I'm sorry. I didn't expect to see him here in Baghdad. You see, I have an appointment with him tonight in Damascus. You're not getting out alive. And I'm not either. You say, isn't it more? No, no, no. It's motivating. I can get my act together a little bit more just since I've been studying on this sermon. Live while you can live. Little postcard. Think about enjoy life. This is not a dress rehearsal. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Help us in Jesus' name to be ready. Not Lord to sit around morbidly saying, I'm gonna die, but rather to say, When I die, I want to be ready to go. Having made practical benefit for others for my own life, and ready to meet the Lord through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. It's time for our communion. 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, I'm going to read from you for just, read to you for just a moment. And by the way, if anybody does not have the cup with the wafer and the fruit of the vine in it, would you raise your hand if you need that cup? I know that we're passing them out at the door. We really appreciate that. They will thank you. In 1 Corinthians 11, let me read a portion of what the Apostle Paul said. For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You realize that so often we celebrate birthdays, the day of one's birth, but we rarely ever celebrate the day of one's death. But we do with Jesus. Celebrate in the sense of remembrance and gratitude. You know, soon we'll sort of celebrate Veterans Day. And we also have a Memorial Day when we remember those who've given their service, and many have given their lives for us. We remember Jesus because of what he did for us. And we won't be ready for death or eternal life until we settle it with him. So we thank God for this sacrifice. We proclaim the Lord's death. This table is for everyone who is a believer in Jesus Christ. We invite you to partake. Let's take the cups. The top, as you open it, has within it a wafer representing the bread, which speaks of the body of 
our Savior. I like to take this wafer and break it, reminding us that by whip, sword, spear, nail, horn, and fist, they broke apart the body of our Savior. I try to think of at least one aspect of that suffering. <coughs> Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. All of you, eat it, and so we do. Let us take the cup. The Lord Jesus said, this is my blood shed for many for the remission of sins. All of them drink it. And so we do. It is done as the Lord has commanded. If you're here and you're not sure you're ready to die in Christ Jesus, please make an appointment with me. You know, they say it's helpful if you have life insurance. You realize life insurance isn't for you. It's for those you and I. But the life insurance of Christ, that is for you. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or if we can help you in some other spiritual way, baptize, join the church, or just pray with you. Please make an appointment. Let us sing together. There's an old hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. The words will be on the screen. What we do here the first Sunday of the month when we have communion Sunday is we ask everyone who's able or would like to, if you'll just make a big circle around the sanctuary, out into the narthex and up here at the front, one big circle, and we just sing in our unity about serving the Lord until we're together with you. say thank God for this gathering. Amen. Amen. Yes. Let's sing together. Bless me Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Hi, Jack.